Hi everyone, it's Judy. Welcome back to the On Track Podcast. Today we talk to an inspiring person, John Gottfried, who is the co-founder of Major League Hacking. We discuss the vision that MLH has in inspiring over 125,000 students worldwide that come from both traditional and non-traditional backgrounds. They've inspired a whole new generation of engineers from software, hardware, mechanical, and the events they throw worldwide. So lean in and enjoy. I'll see you on the other side. Welcome to All Teams On Track Podcast, where we talk to leaders about PCB design, tackling subjects ranging from schematic capture all the way to the manufacturing floor. I'm your host, Judy Warner. Please listen in every week and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcast apps. And be sure to check out the show notes at altium.com forward slash podcast, where you can find great resources and multiple ways to connect with us on social media. Well, good morning, John. Thanks so much for joining us on the On Track podcast. I look forward to talking with you and sharing you with our audience. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. So um, recently, John and I met uh, through a, a phone call, and we got to talking, and of course, we geeked out and had lots in common. So um, most of the audience may know that our tagline for the podcast, as well as our event, All Team Live, is learn, connect, get inspired. So I would say that this is one of those get inspired uh portions of the podcast as well as connects because we hope to connect you with John. So John, why don't you start out by talking about your background, your professional background, educational background, and what led you to co-found Major League Hacking? Sure. So I started off as a hobbyist programmer since I was a little kid. I, you know, was building websites, I was building games, you know, playing around with different technologies. And, uh, you know, as I got older, I started doing it for work and eventually, you know, kind of ended up on a weird path to being in the tech industry. I uh, got a history degree in college and for money on the side, I would uh, build apps for people. And when I graduated, I discovered this amazing role called developer evangelism, which is this really cool combination of tech and working with people. And that's really what drew me back into doing it as my profession and ultimately led me to uh, starting MLH. Interesting. So um, what really led you to feel so passionate about this that you wanted to start a company? When I uh, graduated from college, I had gone through a lot of CS classes and, and met with a lot of people in the local tech community here in New York. And I realized that there was this like huge disconnect between what we were learning in classes and what people actually did day to day in the industry. And when I ended up getting this uh, job as a developer evangelist at Twilio, it exposed me to this massive community that existed around tech. You know, these were people who wanted to build things for fun. They were people who were passionate about technology in a way that wasn't purely academic or professional. And, you know, that was something that really resonated with me and something that I wish I had when I was in school. You know, the, the CS classes that I did try to take while studying history were fairly dry and academic. And, you know, when I uh, was able to go back and, and expose students to the community side of it, I could see that that had a huge impact on them. And so when we decided to start MLH, a lot of that came out of that experience of working with students one-on-one -on -one as you know, developer evangelists, wishing that I had that when I was a student, and then ultimately seeing the impact that it had when students started self-organizing around their passion in technology and creating these communities that inspired people to, to learn. And you know that is really what drove us in the early days was these one-on-one -on -one connections with people who were super excited about the work they were doing and uh, our ability to support it in a, in a bigger way. And you know the, the company came out of a desire to scale that and reach more people more than anything else. That's exciting. Well, community, you know, you're singing my song there, buddy. So I don't know if you know that my title is Director of Community Engagement. So something I'm also p 
passionate about is marrying technology and community. So, um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what type of event MLH puts on um, and tell us a little bit about your company, how many employees, what kind of coaches you have, and a little bit of, you know, give us sort of a, a mental picture of what one of your events looks like. Major League Hacking is really the global community for student developers. And that manifests in a couple of different ways, mostly through in-person events. Uh, what we're best known for is our hackathons, which are these weekend-long invention competitions where developers, designers, engineers, product people come together, come up with their own ideas, and build working prototypes in a really short period of time. And that's really our flagship event series. Beyond that, we also do technical workshops through our MLH local host program where students can learn a specific bite-sized technical skill in an hour or two. And then we do a, a series of distributed events called Local Hack Day that are either focused on hackathons or on uh, learning specific skills. And those happen throughout the year. So um, what are your student demographics like? What kind of, you know, when you and I talked earlier, we were, you were saying that, you know, you took a non-traditional path to find your passion and that you sort of attract a similar demographic, but some traditional um, students as well. So tell us about that non-traditional path and also about your student demographics. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, you know, when people think of computer science, when they think of computer engineering, you know, they have this like stereotypical, almost Dilbert-esque picture in their <laughs> minds. And, uh, you know, we try really hard to get away from that. Like, we look at it largely as an art as much as a science. And so when we reach out to students, we're reaching out to people who are studying, you know, typical technical disciplines like EE or CE or CS but also maybe people who are studying art, maybe people who are studying history, physics, math, you know, basket weaving, whatever it is. <laughs> and, you know, because technology is becoming part of the fabric of every part of our lives, all of those people have something to contribute in building it. And that's super important to us as an organization. And we're starting to see the results of that in terms of the demographics of our community. I mean, you know, compared to a typical CS department, we have, you know, easily two to three times as many women represented, for example, and that's mm -hmm. kind of one one small part of diversity, but uh, it is a, a really important factor in building community because you want people to feel welcome, you want them to feel like there's a diversity of perspectives, and, you know, you want people to, uh, you know, discover their passion for technology when they come through these events, and, you know, that's something that we invest a lot of time and energy in. And it's really manifested through a lot of our on the ground staff. So you mentioned earlier, uh, our coaches, you know, our coaches are essentially student leaders, right? Mm -hmm. They're the people who are role models for their fellow students. And they, you know, get to go to hackathons as their job on the weekends, which is really fun. But more importantly than that, they're the people out there setting an example and building community on a really local level. And, you know, that's uh, integral to, to anything that's at this scale, right? right. You, you really get to see something that happens on a global scale because there's so many local people who care about, uh, you know, bringing it to their own campuses. Right. Well, it, we shot a video of students here and I took it to, I did a talk at uh, Michigan Tech and um, also at the ACETA conference in Tucson. And one woman engineer came up to me and she says, you need to tell your cameraman, you need to get more women in there. And I'm like, believe me, we would if we could. But it, the student population is heavily swayed towards, you know, males for sure and sometimes caucasian males depending on the part of the world you're from and so i really noticed um i i'm not sure when this podcast will come out but we did uh john and i did an interview for the on track newsletter as well and there's great pictures in there and what i noticed about mlh's photos over many teams i deal with 
is there were so many women in there, plus diversity, diversity of culture. I mean, it was really so delightful to see what a, a melting pot you've created in your community. And, and I was just in awe. But I see that by opening up that demographic, right? And, you know, along those lines, there's conversation around encouraging a new acronym STEAM, which includes art rather than just STEM. So so what do you think of that? And does that play a role, sort of that, that form of thinking around what you're doing? I, I mean, I definitely think that technology is an art. It's not about how good your algorithm is. It's about, you know, how much does what you're building resonate with people? And that requires a different skill set than was traditionally represented in tech. And, you know, I, I think that the more people you bring in from various backgrounds, expertise, you know, parts of the world, whatever it is, uh, the more interesting the technology becomes. You know, the people who go to our events in Mexico versus San Francisco are solving totally different problems. And that is important, right? And all of those people have something to, to share and some kind of impact that they want to create. And that's something we, we strongly encourage. And I think that, you know, it's, uh, it is good to think of it as an art because uh, not everyone is attracted to like the hard maths and sciences. I certainly wasn't at all. Me neither, and, buddy. You know, yeah, and, and you know, I like the creative aspects of it a lot, and so do many other people. And, and you know, that's something we want to showcase. You know, some of my favorite projects are not technically complex, but they are super creative and uh, I would say like emotionally interesting in how people relate to them. Yeah, I, anyways, I just think you're really onto something there, but you're really the first organization that I think has bridged that divide successfully in a, like you said, in a scalable way. And I think um, besides, you know, opening up the conversation for other people to have um, different viewpoints, I love the idea that you have boots on the ground at a local level, right? That can be relatable in that culture, whether it's a culture of a campus or a country or a demographic, whatever it is. I, I love that, that model that you've made. Um, you know, you have been heavily involved in the software side and, and um, many people who come to your events are as well, but you also have a hardware aspect, which I think resonates um, with our community here at Altium. So tell us about the role of hardware in your events and how students get involved on the hardware side. Since we have uh, people from all different disciplines, um, you do see a wide variety of projects. I mean, I've seen everything from a website or a mobile app to a robot or a homemade self-driving car. And, uh, you know, it's something that like, I think is particularly cool about it because what we do is we make hardware available to the students for free at their events. So we have something called the Hardware Lab where they can come to any hackathon and loan out components, devices, peripherals for free and build on them over the weekend. And that's something that most schools don't have available. So mm -hmm. it's sometimes people's first exposure. And when you're thinking about like bringing more people into this industry or getting them excited about hardware or engineering, exposure is often the first step. You know, if they've grown up and they've never touched an Arduino before, sometimes the first time they use it is that like light bulb moment that really gets them excited about working with hardware period and can grow into a, a much bigger, you know, interest and passion. So, uh, you know, I think the hardware lab is super, super important to doing that. And, uh, you know, the other part of it is the divide between software and hardware is becoming blurrier and blurrier. It sure you know, is. A lot of hardware devices are uh, in many ways like more user friendly for software developers. And the same is true of software devices and software frameworks being more friendly for people who tra traditionally did hardware development. And, you know, that combination of like different disciplines uh, is making it easier and easier to learn either skill, whichever side you're coming from. Yeah, I 
I that really resonates with me. I say this to people a lot, especially when I'm dealing with students. I say the lines are being blurred between software, mechanical, electrical. It they like you said, they're getting more and more blurry all the time. So as you attract this more diverse, you know, the non-traditional student versus the more traditional, you know, math and science student, um, why don't you start on first by talking about the impact you see on the on the non-traditional. I agree with you, exposure. I mean, I have said this a million times. We have trouble, John, in the, I come from the PCB manufacturing space and they're losing workforce. But I think is again, lack of exposure. People don't know there's good jobs and they don't know they get to work with robotic equipment or, you know, fancy, you know, pick and place equipment or this really neat uh, manufacturing space because they're still thinking of like the industrial revolution with the smoky dark factories right and it's of course nothing yeah. like that but the only thing that cures that is exposure so again really hats off to you for for figuring out that equation for this community so back to non-traditional students what do you think the impact is for for that demographic I mean uh you know, this is going to sound a little bit cliche, but I do think it's a life-changing experience for a lot of people. And, you know, certainly we, we like to think that MLH is a driving force for that. I think it is for a lot of people, but in many ways, it's even broader than that. You know, if you're part of a technical community of people who are supportive and inclusive and creative and passionate about what they're doing, that is a, a life-changing experience. And, you know, it, gives people a confidence and a like excitement about technology that they might not have just from like sitting through a normal class. And so in terms of bringing in folks from non-traditional backgrounds, you know, uh, it's a lot to ask of a student when they're going into college to decide what their career and what their discipline is going to be. It sure is. And so, you know, because of that, we like to give people space to experiment that's fairly risk-free. Like no one's grading you, no one's evaluating your job performance. Maybe what you build fails completely and all you get out of it is like, you tried, that's fine. Uh, and I think that that is why it's so impactful on people is because they stretch out of their, you know, comfort zone skill-wise uh in a way that they don't get to do in a normal day-to-day -day environment and that applies to people whether they're studying computer science or engineering or art or history it doesn't really matter it's all about like putting them in this environment where they're encouraged and uh you know rewarded for stretching themselves and learning and you know when you look at like the bleeding edge of pedagogy and and you know uh educational theory a lot of it is around like that type of peer learning and you know essentially like project-based learning that really represents what people do at these extracurricular events like hackathons mm -hmm. and what think what impact do you think this does have on say ee students or ce students you know that are taking that more traditional route what impact do you think your events have on that population I mean, when you go out into the workforce, like you know this as well as I do, is that there's no silos anymore. Like no one's going into a technical job and being told like, build this really specific thing that I've already decided for you. You know, they're involved in the planning process, the decision, sometimes even the customer discovery process. And those are the skills that they, they can build. Um, you know, I think that uh, it is, very much designed to be a self-driven learning experience. So like when you go to a hackathon, the first step is come up with an idea, any idea, then get people excited and form a team around it, then build it. You know, it sounds like a really simple formula, but like there are very few times where someone gets given that abstract of a prompt. Uh, 
and has to just run with it. And that's where a lot of that learning comes from is them figuring it out as they go. And then at the end, getting feedback from people who, you know, are their peers, maybe their mentors, maybe professionals who can say, hey, like this is a really cool approach. How did you do that? Or, hey, have you seen this alternate way of doing that? And that's, you know, the, the takeaway that a lot of these students have from, from being part of these events. Well, again, from my perspective of um, kind of spearheading the academic uh, programs here at Altium, we keep hearing again and again and again from OEMs in industry um, that what they're looking for is student candidates that have this multidisciplinary sort of systems-based thinking, right? And so they are looking for what we may have thought in in the past of soft skills. So team building, um, uh, con- creative thinking, uh, team building, critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, all these things that may have seemed like, well, as long as you have your technical skills on board, we don't care. Well, those days are over. Like you have to know how all the pieces work together in context. So um, we see this over and over again. And again, I think you're providing experience that really mimics real life, right? And, and, you know, you and I talked about, I'd like you to, to, to mention this, you know, you and I shared a common experience, but I think you actually know more about it. You know, I learned from someone here who runs a prototype lab at UCSD in San Diego about the constraints of, say, a traditional university education in an ECE department, right? And it has to do with research. So, you know, I'm like, well, why don't you teach PCB design? Because they're going to need it, even if they're getting an EE. And this guy said, no way, not going to happen because there's no research dollar. So can you talk a little bit about that and what, what you've noticed about what gets rewarded and, and why some of these things aren't naturally integrated in a university traditional experience yeah I mean it's complicated Um, (laughs) you know when you look at how professors are incentivized a lot of it is around research like you said so you apply for a grant you apply for some kind of government funding and it's project specific or you know discipline specific and that's what guarantees your future employment, right? If you can go back to the university and say, hey, like I have $10 million for the next 10 years to study this really specific thing. But then teaching is like a a side requirement of that. You know, the university says, okay, you know, you're researching here, but you have to teach too. And for most professors, it's, it's, you know, a balancing act between the type of research that they're required to do for funding and the, the requirement to teach. And those things are not necessarily uh, well aligned in a lot of mm-hmm. cases. And, you know, of course, there are a lot of really amazing professors out there who do a great job of teaching those core skills and teaching people how to build. But at the same time, they're, you know, being dragged in different directions by yeah. the, the needs to, you know, have a tenure track position. And yeah. that's really difficult to, to deal with. I think that um, when you look at like, uh, the best teachers and maybe the best programs out there, um, a lot of them are really intentional efforts by different educational institutions or you know groups to specifically teach like practical skills. Mm-hmm. And that has to be something that you know the whole department has to agree is important in order for it to be successful because otherwise you know you're not going to have the funding available to do it right. Um, and it's it's tough. I, I think, That's kind of why you see so many people going to these boot camp programs, going to extracurricular activities. It's because they want those practical skills that maybe they can't get in a traditional environment. Yeah, and I always say everybody's innocent. You know, (laughs) we're really, neither you or I are, we're actually feel empathetic towards those professors and trying to, to do that balancing act. It's a tough one, and it isn't one I would like to try to, to work out, you know, uh, you know, some things that do work, I think, 
But again, in a very, very traditional environment is like student engineering competitions like Hyperloop or SAE. I think they yeah. get a really, really incredible. We've, we have, um, in fact, I'll share it in the show notes. We have a, uh, page where it shows all these student stories, you know, of the incredible, they build rockets and CubeSats and all this stuff. Now, they get that in the context of um, a university supported program and whatnot. But, uh, but not everybody can do that. Not, a, you know, not every student can manage those kind of demands in their schedule or afford the financial aspect or whatever you know it's just not for everybody so I'm always like well who else is going to fill that gap well some labs are are doing that on campus and you know I think more and more we're going to see people like you right because you're filling that that much needed gap between um, traditional education and industry but also in such an inspiring, passionate way that I'm really excited about. I love seeing, because I'm a non-traditionalist. I would have been all over that. Um, and I fell into the career. Who knew I would, I come from a very artistic family. Who knew I'd fall in love and printed circuit boards? Like I couldn't put that together. But I now realize that that type of bent is related, you know, and... Um, yeah. But it took, a lot of people have that experience. Yeah, it's who knew. But so I think you're really opening that up. So again, kudos to you. Um, you and I also talked about um, sort of these perfect conditions that exist right now that have really opened the floodgates, right? It's almost uh, created the perfect soil conditions for a company like MLH to emerge um, and we were discussing that earlier so uh, again I'll share this in the in the show notes in fact I think I'm even going to queue up a clip for our audience right here that's that's why we think that this moment in time is, ex is especially exciting too. You know, there's been tens, hundreds of billions of dollars poured into, uh, you know, the mobile mobile devices and consumer electronics, and so the the raw material that's out there right now is some of the you know the the you know smallest, cheapest, most right. powerful. Uh, raw material that, that's ever existed before. So um, the really exciting thing is you can build a lot of these small companies that kind of draft off of these technology platforms that are available right now. Um, and they can they can achieve amazing things with uh, with budgets that, you know, were kind of unheard of, uh, you know, even 10 years ago. Um, so that that's really exciting for us with yeah. some of the application processors and and uh, and wireless modules and and uh, software platforms. Um, you can do so much uh, and move so quickly as a small company. This podcast was with Tyler Minty from Bolt, who is a, a technology uh, accelerator in the Bay Area. And he talked about, you know, how really the development of smartphones and how we all have technology all over us um, has opened up the hardware side of it. But you kind of enlightened me to... So in other words, chips are cheaper. We can we have Arduino boards, Beagle boards. We have Raspberry Pis. We have, you know, chips that are within reach of, say, a student or a hacker or a hobbyist. But you sort of said the same thing's happening on the software side. Can you talk about that for a moment? Yeah. You know, it's funny. Like, I remember uh, when I was a kid trying to spin up various weird businesses and websites and app ideas and the process of hosting it somewhere was incredibly complex mm -hmm. and i eventually had to rent a entire server in a data center that was just like a dedicated machine and all the time i would get these emails like hey the hard drive in your server has failed we have to replace it right which is just like <laughs> bizarre concept and you know, it was like a literal piece of hardware that I rented. <laughs> right. That's a pain. That's a huge pain. And it's a huge barrier to entry having to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Now, anyone, you could be a student, you could be a you know super experienced professional, you could be a Fortune 100 company. 
They can sign up for a cloud hosting platform and rent a server by the minute that is virtualized, maintained by someone else, secured by someone else, and you know, much, much more cost effective and much lower barrier to entry. And that makes you know learning these skills so much more attainable because there's no prerequisites that you need. You know, like you're building your first website. All you do is sign up for an account and click go. Right. Yeah. And that's a uh, super important development in, in the same way that like Arduino is so much simpler than circuitry was 20 years ago. Hosting a web app or a mobile app is so much simpler than it was 20 years ago. And that's what allows these people to learn skills so quickly. And it's what allows them ultimately to have like these self driven experiences, mm -hmm. a huge part of our model is that's driven by students and student groups. Yeah. And that would not be possible if they had to rely on, you know, having a huge amount of startup funding or having uh, resources from external partners, whatever it is. Uh, it's only possible because there's this low barrier to entry and it makes them kind of feel like superheroes, right? They, you know, can build an app in a weekend that millions of people can use. And that's, like a really magical thing that's never existed before, you know, in the history of humanity. And it, it's part of what makes this like little snapshot in time that we're living through so mm -hmm. unique. And, and it's what allows MLH to exist. It's what allows our community to exist. And, you know, it's given life to a ton of new businesses that, you know, no one could have imagined just a couple of years ago. Yep. Yep. I totally agree. It puts a smile on my face to think about, students or makers or hackers or high school students or junior high students even being able to have access to this kind of technology and I, it just makes me smile thinking of um, them as superheroes right they can access you know like you said 10 20 years ago this was only technology that could be accessed by um, really well established companies with deep pockets right and now I like what you said when we were on the phone earlier that a that a student in a dorm room could you know launch a startup on a weekend <laughs> so yeah you know that's very cool um, so to wax philosophical for a moment what do you think the impact of these you know this first time in history this technology sort of being unleashed what what kind of things do you sort of imagine, you know, might flow out of this? I mean, you can look at literally any part of our world today and see how it's being shaped by technology. It could be your healthcare provider, it could be your insurance company, it could be your bank, it could be your local government, your state government, federal government, like they're all undergoing these drastic transformations that are really you know, caused by this technological revolution, for lack of a better term. There's so many small examples yes. too. Like how many people who are learning to drive right now wouldn't be able to read a paper map, right? Like, you know, there's all these things that yeah. are, are just like core to how people live their lives that, that are easy to overlook because they're so convenient. Um, and I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg. I, I think that in the next 10, 20, 30 years, it's going to be even more drastically different. And it's really difficult to even predict what that's going to look like. Um, everyone right now is talking about AI and machine learning and how that's going to change society. But like, uh, what AI does now is so simplistic that it's really hard to even imagine what that will look like when it's like, particularly advanced. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, programmers and technology creators have a, a responsibility to like use their powers for good. Uh, I, I don't think that technical skills are inherently, um, you know, good or evil or aligned in a certain way, but certainly you can build good or evil things with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I think it's really important that the people who are coming up right now and just entering the industry, like, have that moral compass and have a good understanding of the impact of what they're building. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's even hard to measure that impact until much further down the line. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Anything like technology is neutral in and of itself. What we do with it 
is a whole nother story, right? And that that moral compass is, I think, going to play a bigger and bigger role. And I think probably as societies across the globe, we're going to have to start taking a hard look at, you know, I mean, I have kids in their 20s and I think, was it really good to unleash an, the internet completely unguarded on a whole generation? Was that really good? I mean, they could access any kind of junk, you know, as well as yeah. fun games or, you know, I remember my youngest daughter who's now uh, in her mid twenties, you know, she did a PowerPoint in the second grade for goodness sakes, you know? And so it, there's, there's benefits. It helps her in her career today. And, um, but also as a parent, I remember feeling terrified, you know, of putting up some kind of like hosting to protect them from all the, the dark side. Right. So yeah. I think it's, it's really interesting time. You'd think that a whole like series of dystopian, like novels and movies would hit the market right about now. Right. Maybe we'll see some of that too. I don't know. Yeah. You never know. I mean, I love science fiction and, Me too. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of books that were written in like the 80s or the 70s predicting what the future of technology would look like that you know some of them are pretty fantastical still but some of them are not far off from the truth and yeah you know it's uh you know we live in interesting times right yeah um i, I was part of the i think i'm a little older than your kids but i was part of the last generation to have dial-up and uh i, I just remember um this really distinct feeling that I needed to learn technical skills to do anything remotely interesting with technology. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, th I think in many ways, like that forced me to become technical and, and be a programmer and, you know, engineer at an early age. But, you know, the easier it gets, I wonder if that's even going away where it's just like a consumption device and, you know, what are the implications of that? Yeah, it's it'll be interesting. I think we're on a ride and we're strapped in. It's not we're not getting off. But, yeah, there's know, no going back. There's no going back. We're strapped in. This car has this train has left the station. So it's just kind of interesting, I think, to kind of ponder the implications. So for you as a as a business owner, and um, again, thank you so much for this conversation. I'm fascinated with what you're doing and just a huge fan and. Um, what kind of things, uh, like what gets you excited and gets you out of bed in the morning and also what freaks you out and maybe keeps you up at night? Uh, it's the same thing for both. Uh, <laughs> MLH is what keeps me up at night and also what gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, you know, it's, it's when you're running a startup, especially a smaller startup, the buck stops with you, right? Like there's no one to pass something off onto. There's no one who's a backup for what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the exciting part of it, you know, is that you really have this control over your own destiny and you can make a huge impact with everything you do in the organization. The flip side of that is if you make a mistake, that has a huge impact on the organization too. And I think you know, it's a constant balancing act. You know, there are days that are amazing and it's like, wow, I can't believe that we created this thing that has impacted so many people. And there are days where it's like, oof, I can't believe we did that thing that impacted so many people. <laughs> and you know, that's just part of the process and it's what I love about this. And I think that, um, you know, it definitely like uh, is a constant learning experience. It's a constant like, you know, challenge, and uh, I, I still love it. I, I think I wouldn't trade it for anything, even though there are many easier jobs out there. Yeah, no, it sounds amazing. Um, so, you know, one reason I wanted to have you on the podcast, you know, and again, I think of you as the get inspired part of what we want to stand for as a company. And so um, what are some ways that our listeners could learn more about MLH? And are there any ways that, say, companies, individuals that want to be mentors or is there how, how can we help connect our community with your community? 
Yeah, so one of the things that's really important to us, both in terms of accessibility and also just you know the, the model that we've pursued is that all of our programs are free for students to be part of. So wow. the students can attend for free, they get access to all of these resources for free, and that's really important when you're trying to build community and when you're trying to bring in you know, folks from non-traditional backgrounds that aren't well represented in tech. Um, and so the funding comes from corporate partners, you know, everyone from huge Fortune 100 companies all the way down to tiny startups, you know, they're making this possible. And, you know, companies can sponsor on a local level and show up for an event in their backyard at whatever the local high school or college is, or they can get involved at a national or a global level and reach people all over the world. Uh, MLH, you know, works with about 125,000 students a year. and. Uh, you know, all of those people are excited to learn about like bleeding edge products and technology. That's part of their learning experience. And it's, you know, really great that we've been able to partner with so many amazing companies to make that possible. And I think that like, you know, for folks who are listening, uh, at a minimum, you know, if you devote your weekend to going to one of these events and mentoring students and just helping them work through problems and, you know, giving them feedback, that's a win, right? Like that is a really positive contribution. If you want to have a bigger impact, you know, your company can get involved, your business can get involved. And, you know, it's a great way to uh, find that next generation of people who are going to come work for you and also to, you know, teach people about your products. And, you know, that's a, a win-win for the students and for you. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, will you please be sure to send me your contact information, your website, and so we can pass that on to our listeners and we'll stick it in the show notes so they can reach out to you. Of course. Okay. Well, again, John, big fan. I'm so, um, so pleased to know you. And um, for our listeners, I've, I've extended an invitation that um, John's looking into to join us at All Team Live and just set up a table, no cost, and hopefully get to interact with you not only here in just podcast format, but with you personally if you plan to attend All Team Live um, in San Diego. So um, he's going to get back to me on that. He's got a lot of a lot of um, events going on, so hopefully we can thread the needle and get um, John or some of his team members to come out and meet you face to face. So John, thanks again for joining us. This has been really great to learn about you and, and congratulations on the amazing work you're doing. Thanks, Judy. Uh, I mean, this has been a ton of fun for me and I'm really excited to you know meet more of your community members. Yep. Let's put our communities together. That would be great. So um, thank you, John, and thank you to our audience for tuning in again. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the On Track podcast. Um, a reminder, please like, subscribe, give us comments of what you'd like to hear about. And don't forget, we have two All Team Live events coming up. All Team Live San Diego, October 9th through 11th. And in Frankfurt, October 21 through 23rd, we have stacked up the speakers like you can't believe. Um, and we are putting together an amazing conference. We hope that you can join us. Registration's now open, space is limited. So please go visit our All Team Live website. I will also stick that in the show notes. We will see you next time. Until then, remember to always stay on track.